Well, welcome to my channel, Mispronounce Adventures. My name's Alex, and welcome to our power station video. But this is a bit different. This is a first of its kind, or first of its commercial available product kind. And I'm working with Bluetti. Now, it is the time of year where I'm between the main art trips of the channel, and also I've just put the deposit down on a new van build. So I'm working with companies I like to work with, particularly Bluetti, because it helps fund all the rest of the channel's content. And I like technology anyway, and there's been plenty of power stations. I've been using power stations from a variety of company of years, doing a whole variety of different things, from stupid uses, since using one of the power electric stand-up paddleboard, Yar! to spending my last couple Arctic winters using them as they're a key part of my backup electrical system for this van. Well, power stations have their use. Need to do some of the heat shrinking for the electrics, and it's currently minus 20 in the Arctic. And the amount of times I've spent underneath this van using power stations to run a heat gun to defrost components. So I've got quite a bit of experience now playing with a variety of models and brands. I've also been working with Bluetti for a couple of years now, for doing e-bike, e-camping adventures in Scotland with their power stations. I just think this is brilliant. But also recent, they've been making quite a few interesting products. From the Charger 1 alternator charger, which was a universal alternator charger for all variety of power stations. And the new Apex 300, which is the first power station I can find with a 50 amp, 12 volt DC output, so you could run an entire van off it if you wanted. And they sent me a new model of a power station, which is the first of its time commercially. It's a power station, but it's not a lithium power station. It's sodium. So. First off, we'll unbox it, have a look at the specs of the unit and what it actually does as a power station. And then we'll sort of have a look at sodium as a battery type, as an alternative, but probably not a replacement to lithium or LiPo4 based batteries and power stations. And look at a few of the pros and cons of what that type of battery chemistry can do. So let's get into it. Now, I wanted to get my hands on one of these as soon as I saw it announced because it's different. It's a different bit of technology and I have a history of playing with tech on this channel in the camper van van life niche. And there we go, sodium ion battery. Now, much like lithium ion, lithium ion is, a, is an umbrella name for a group of battery chemistries, of which one of them is LiPo4, which we often use for our camper van leisure batteries, and a lot of the newer power station models use them. Sodium ion, again, is an umbrella term for the sodium battery chemistry family. I don't actually know at, the, at this moment in time which specific chemistry it's using, but hopefully we can find out by the end of the video. And quite appropriately, it's called the Pioneer Series, or Pioneer NA, NA being the, the periodic table sign for sodium. And as I said, we'll talk about sodium itself a little bit later on. So let's get this unboxed, oh, great, unbox and have a look at it. Warranty card and manual, accessory box, which we'll open in a moment. The unit itself. We'll go in there, let's just quickly check in the box. Comes with, comes with your standard 12 volt cigarette charger, so you can plug it into the dashboard of your van to charge it, and a barrel connector. Bluetti seems to always use the barrel connectors and not go for XC60 connectors, which is more popular in other brands. Same for its solar input. So again, you've got your MC4 connector to a barrel connector, the charge port, we'll look at the ports closely later on. And your standard, being a UK model, AC charging plug. And a screw for a earthing pin if needed. So, first observation itself, and mine for all the normal stuff. Big NA written on the top, sodium and a plus. And it's also a wireless charging pad, so you can charge your phone if you wanted on it. Spec-wise, it is a 900 watt hour power station, which is about my favorite personal area, which is around the one kilowatt power station. I like that size because it gives you plenty of capacity, still a portable size, and usually has a big inverter. We'll deep dive into each individual component, but on the front, you've got your DC in, which can either be your 12 volt, or your solar, your standard 12 volt socket out, rated to 10 amp, USB-A and USB-C, your inverter, and your buttons and screen. Cross round onto the other side, your, your AC in, your setable fuse, and the earth pin. Your standard sticker telling all about the unit specs itself, what it can do. Ventilation, on the top as already mentioned, wireless charging and mentioning the Bluetooth app, which we'll play with in a bit. And on the bottom, nothing apart from some pads. Well, let's first have a look at its merits as a power station. So you've got your variety of USBs, which are activated by the DC, and you've got one USB-C 100 watt, which we should see 100 watt charging in a moment. Here we go, 100 watt USB-C charging. So that's gonna be plenty enough to charge a power station or do things like run your laptop. Although it would be nice to have more than one USB-C. And your standard USB-A, which hardly needs explaining for just all your lower powered ones. They are only three amp max per two sockets, so it's a maximum of 15 watt out. 
For me, the most important part of any power station is the ability to use AC appliances off grid. For me, this is usually me running a heat gun outside in the Arctic to defrost components of the van. So it's got to 1,500 watt output on the inverter, which is plenty to do a lot of different things. It's plenty enough to run an induction stove. Or running the heat gun for me doing electrics. About 1100 watt and 2000 watt should overload it and the standard overload protection if you had to go over it. As it's rated to 1500 watt, it should try and run this 1900 watt thing for a few seconds and then eventually turn off into overload and then you have to reset it. Now, there's no point of running all these high powered items if you can't charge it. First off, DC charging. For the supplied 12 volt cable, like you see on your dashboard, that's gonna be limited to about 120 watt DC charging. The port itself is limited to 60 volt, which means you could have solar panels up to 60 volt VOC, or you could use something like the Blue Etty Charger 1 alternator charger for power stations, have that set to its maximum 56 volt output, and charge this at a total of 500 watts, as the port itself is limited to a maximum of 500 watt charging, which would charge this 900 watt hour power station from zero to 100% in just under two hours. For me though, the way I charge most of my power stations is via AC, as that's usually the fastest. Now, the Blue Etty Pioneer, it's limited to about 500 watt charging by default, which again is gonna be around two hours from zero to full at that charge speed on a 900 watt hour power station. But let's get into the app and see if there's anything else we can do. And same as usual, you've got access to the Blue Etty app. And there you go, the usual AC DC controls what the DC charging's doing, what the AC input's doing, the DC output's doing, ability to turn them on and off from the app itself, and in settings, a few of the types of mode. Eco, how long the AC or the DC would stay on for, and what the threshold power is it for automatically turning off, how long the screen type is out for, and standard charging mode. Let's quickly put it up to turbo to see if we can get past that 450 watts I saw earlier. Well, there you go, turbocharging, significantly quicker. Now, a lot of power stations give you full access to their full charging power without going into settings. However, extremely fast charging can shorten the life of, well, I know lithium battery chemistries, but lithium and sodium are both metal-based battery chemistries, so I imagine there's a similar effect that super fast charging can decrease the overall lifespan of battery chemistry. So probably about time we talk about battery chemistry and sodium. First off, I can't talk about sodium battery chemistry without knowing which specific one it is. And since it isn't in the documentation, it's just sodium ion, which is the family, I decided it would be a great idea to disassemble this brand new unreleased pre-production unit, which is a first of its kind, so I could look at the cells internally and see which specific variation of sodium battery chemistry they were using, because that's quite important to the performance. Oh no. I may have voided my warranty. That is a joke because if you receive, most of the power station companies I work for, if you receive a power station for review and then you get to keep it, then there is no warranty attached to it and that's usually outlined in most contracts. So I wouldn't recommend doing this to your one because it would probably void the warranty, but mine doesn't have any warranty to begin with, so there we go. But I wanted to know which particular cells, sodium cells it was using, so I can go research it and find what other elements are in those cells. Uh, but I should probably go put it back together. As for serviceability, I don't know if you know how to take it apart, not too bad. Um, it's kind of built in layers with big bolts which join everything together. So it's not super tricky, there's just quite a few few steps. And even things like this, which I guess is from, from assembling point of view, it's fittings which pop together opposed to having to cut wires and so on. Now, I don't normally disassemble power stations when I'm doing a review, but this one had some new technology being those sodium cells, so I particularly wanted to have a look at them for this. But it also gave me an opportunity to see some of the other advertised features and how they actually have been constructed internally. One of the examples of that was its smart cooling feature, which is ducting from the intake fan across the heat sinks, which is just a more efficient way of doing it. Little features like that, it was great to actually see how that has been a marketing point, but actually how that manifested itself in the actual final unit. I also like how it's being constructed. It's not got any awkward plastic clips which break if you're trying to remove them and nothing is permanently glued onto the board. It's all nice plugs which could easily be undone and redone. As far as it goes for actually constructing and deconstructing, it's fairly simple and it only took me about nine minutes to put it back together again. Right, sodium battery technology. This next section is gonna be quite wordy. So to begin with, sodium battery technology 
and lithium battery technology are both metal type battery technologies. The active ion in them is sodium in the sodium batteries and lithium in lithium batteries. For this section, we're going to specifically be looking at the type of sodium cells in here versus LiPo4 cells, which is often used in other models of power station. And having a look at the cells and doing some research, I think I've identified the model and what the cells are. So for LiPo4 power stations, the cells are often called this, lithium iron phosphate oxygen, and that gets shortened to LiPo4. Now, it is the same for the sodium cells. It isn't just sodium metal. And this is the chemical makeup I can find, which for the cells being used, which is layered oxide cathode based cells. It doesn't quite roll off the tongue like LiPo4. So whilst LiPo4 could be called lithium iron phosphate, the sodium ones would be called sodium iron magnesium oxide. And that is just the simplified formula for the cathode chemistry. There are some variations which come into that family as well, which Bluetti could be using. But they both function in the exact same way. During the charging process, a ion from the cathode moves through the electrolyte to the anode. That is how charging works. But the cathode, electrolyte and anode are completely different between LiPo4 and the sodium cells used here. One of the main marketing points I see in my research for sodium batteries is promoting the point that it's nickel and cobalt free. But most of the time it's being compared to lithium's LiPo4 chemistry, that's also nickel and cobalt free. So in some ways that's a moot point. Per weight of a cell, the sodium actually and the lithium content is quite low. For lithium LiPo4 cells, only around 4% of the actual mass of the cell is lithium. And for the sodium, whilst it seems there's less information about on it at the minute, again, it's around the overall mass of the cell. It seems from what I can find anywhere between four and 7% of the mass of the cell is actually sodium. The majority of both those cells, around 38% to 40% of cell by mass is actually carbon. But the reason they're called sodium or lithium cells is the active ion, which is moving between the cathode and the anode and the anode and the cathode is lithium or sodium. So what is sodium? Sodium is something that to a degree, we interact with every day. Table salt is sodium chloride, which is one atom of sodium, one atom of chlorine. And it's a very abundant, uh, the ocean, seawater is salty, salt pans, rock salt mining. The industrial origin currently of the majority of sodium metal comes from rock salt mining and using a process called the Downs process, where effectively salt is heated to 800 degrees plus and then a lot of electricity is put through it and that breaks the bonds between the sodium atom and the chlorine atom. And you get a yield from looking at the average yield process of a thousand kilograms of salt going in, you would get around 390 kilograms of sodium coming out. And to be really boring, at average salinity levels of the ocean, for a thousand liters of seawater, about 35 kilograms of that would be salt. And from that, you could get about 12 kilograms of sodium metal. That's one of the potential future pros of sodium is it's very abundant, which means long term when mass manufacturing is there for sodium cells, sodium cells could be significantly cheaper than lithium as it's a far easier item to obtain. The other main positive for sodium versus the lithium lipo 4 cells is their cold weather performance. Generally lithium can only be charged down to zero degrees, although there are caveats to that. It more depends on the charge current at those lower temperatures. These sodium cells can be charged down to around minus 15, and discharge to around minus 25. Significantly better cold weather performance. But much like any battery tunnel technology, colder the temperature, usually the maximum charge rate is decreased. I've had the power station in a freezer overnight at minus 20, so let's see some of that cold weather performance. Oh, it's, it's definitely frosty. Actually, a bit more frosty than I intended. Right, first off. Now, on the app, there isn't a way to see the internal temperature. But let's make sure discharge is working. Charging, discharging, that's no problem. But then again, the discharge is minus 25. So I guess the bit I wanna see is charging. And if it's been at minus 20 all night, it shouldn't be charging. And we've got a warning. Let's see what warning we've got. Alarm status, cold temperature. Cold temperature alarm set off. Now I can't actually see what temperature this is but I have a device which can help me with that. So let's bring out the thermal camera. And it's also currently in charging low protection status. Right, HD, record. Minus nine, minus 10 inside. Minus eight inside. So the outside of this is gonna warm up pretty quickly. Right, so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna put it back in the freezer and because it's gonna to start to defrost now and put it at a lower temperature like minus 10. 
and we're going to turn it off because it's about to get start to get condensated and wet. Right, hopefully it's warmed up a bit. Looks like it's still too cold. The reason I'm warming it up slowly is because this is cold and there's about 70% humidity, condensation will start to form on, on the surfaces. Discharge is still working though. Or not actually, interesting. Let's turn it off. Okay, rebooting it after the temperature fault. Okay, well, the fault code is gone and it is discharging that. It's not loading battery information. Let's see if it's warmed up when we can get it to charge. So it's notices the grid's connected and it's charging. So charging away. There we go, just apparently needed rebooting. So whilst we are charging, if we're looking inside, I'm still getting some minus readings and the fan is just started up. And on the bottom, it's still pretty cold. Because the bottom where the cells are sitting on, you can see there's a big cold mass there still. It does say in the instructions that the charging will be different. You won't get the full access at the, when it's colder. However, what I'm gonna do is unplug it, turn it off, because I want this to naturally warm up. I don't want the fans sucking in the moist air, which is then gonna condense. And we'll put it back in the freezer and let that warm up slowly. But there you go. Charge is below zero. Not the most interesting test visually to see. Cold temperature charging done. Let's get back to the sodium versus lithium chat. The lifespan of LiPo4 lithium and these type of sodium cells seems to be pretty similar. Much like both of those types of technology, the aging process of lithium, every charge, you deposit some of those lithium ions onto the anode called lithium plating. The same happens for sodium. You deposit some of those sodium ions onto the anode to become sodium plating. And that is the loss of some of your move ions into the metallic metal form. And that is the natural aging process of every time you charge and discharge a battery. So normally for LiPo4, it's around three to 4,000 life cycles, which means at three to 4,000 life cycle mark, you will be down to 70 or 80% of your original capacity. And generally it seems sodium has the around the same lifespan. Although there are certainly no real long-term tests on sodium battery lifespan at the moment. And that plating process, which is the aging of a cell, is increased by doing things like fast charging, which is why it's locked away until you activate it on the app. Plating is also the accelerated damage which occurs when you do cold temperature charging or discharging outside of its operating temperature. One of the drawbacks of sodium is its size. These sodium cells versus LiPo4 lithium cells are around 20% less energy dense, which means versus a LiPo4 cell, your sodium battery is around 20% larger or heavier for the same amount of capacity because there's less energy in the same space, which is an interesting thought for a portable unit as it's heavier for the same capacity, but for domestic uses where weight isn't a problem, potentially long-term larger sodium batteries where weight isn't a problem for cheaper prices, is a good option. For the other one things, LiPo4 batteries themselves are very safe technology and not prone to thermal runaway. Apparently sodium is even safer, although I can't find much ways to actually quantify what that means. A few of the other points I could potentially say as well, there's a difference in the voltage curve. With LiPo4 batteries, generally you maintain a pretty flat voltage until you get to almost empty battery and then it drops steeply. Whilst for sodium, it's more linear. So the, the voltage decreases in a pretty linear fashion for more and more energy that you've used. And hopefully that wasn't too boring to explain a little bit about battery technology. If you're familiar with what the insides of lithium batteries generally look like, it's the same for here. A variety of cells usually put in a series parallel format to increase the overall voltage, as these cells are only around three volt, unlike LiPo4 lithium, which is about 3.2. And then they are, all those cells are managed and balanced by a BMS or the battery management system. So broadly how the technology works is the same, just some of the functionality and the nuances of the cells are pretty different. So what is the main purpose of this? It's called the Pioneer and most of the marking is about its cold temperature use. And well, for me living in the Arctic in the winters makes sense. I've actually got my batteries down below zero a number of times and they've turned off because they can't discharge anymore because I've had got some of my lithium batteries below minus 20 when using them outside. But most people don't live in the Arctic. This does mean even in the UK environment, you could leave this somewhere outside or be using it in a few minus degrees and you'll still be able to happily charge it without causing any damage. Overall, very cool to look at a first of its commercial kind, be that a sodium ion power station designed for some more extreme uses. And 
If you've enjoyed this, consider looking at some of the links in the description and finding out more about it. Or if you want one for yourself because you think it's going to work, potentially looking for the links to order one. And if you like general technology and van, camper van, motorhome overlanding related tech and kit, and the way I do my reviews, consider looking at the channel and finding some of my other videos. Or watching some of my Arctic stuff where I end up using products like this and other bits of kit in some extreme environments. But overall, I just want to make content for you guys to enjoy. So thank you very much for joining me and I'll see you next time. Cheers.